There are times when the viewing of a film might cause the head scratch of disbelief. You will think, I can't believe this film is real. Why does it exist? Someone made this film. Who is responsible? How was logic and common sense totally avoided during its creation? One such movie is the 1965 film Monster A Go Go. Well, hello there, this is Old Man Kelly, and I can't help myself. I need to know the story, the who's, when's, why's. Joe Dante said it best in Trailers from Hell in 2013. There are bad movies, there are worse movies, there are unspeakable movies, and then there are movies that are so bad that they don't really rise to the level of being a movie. He, of course, was talking about Monster A Go Go. The film itself states, What you're about to see may not even be possible within the narrow limits of human understanding. You know, I like to find the good in every film I watch, but this film, well, let us just say, it's going to be difficult. The film's story all begins with a man named Bill Rabain. Bill was born on February 8, 1937 in Riga, Latvia. In 1952, at the age of 15, he came to the United States and learned English by watching American films. He attended the Art Institute of Chicago, majoring in drama. He worked at Chicago's own WGN for years, and he's credited with the introduction of Centarium, a 360-degree motion picture process, something I assume never took off. For a while, Bill worked for Herschel Gordon Lewis's commercial studio making industrial films. He made a few short movies, but after watching Lewis in Chicago independently shoot the risque 1960 feature The Prime Time, he thought it was a good idea to make his own feature. In 1961, Bill decided, in his own words, to create a screenplay that would have some timeless and exploitation values. He wrote a film called Terror at Half Day. When asked where the name Terror at Half Day came from, he responded, I had bought my first house in Wheeling, Illinois, and had to commute through Half Day, back and forth to Chicago. Half Day was a little villa just past Wheeling, and the name intrigued me. He funded the production with $10,000 of his own money and combined it with $50,000 from investors. Interestingly, Rabain said he almost got future president Ronald Reagan to star in the film, but that's another story for another day. While he didn't get Reagan to be in his film, he was able to get the talents of Henry Height. Henry was born Henry Marion Mullins and lived from 1915 to 1978. Henry built himself as the world's tallest man at 8 foot 2 inches, although his actual height was 7 feet 6 and 3 quarter inches. He was known for making personal appearances promoting the Corn King brand as the Corn King Giant. He took on the name Height as part of a vaudeville act, Low Height and Stanley. Rabane knew Height and said that he made the perfect monster without elaborate special effects or prosthetics. Herschel Gordon Lewis said of Height, Henry Height was living in a hotel room on Rush Street in Chicago and was really down on his luck. His physical condition was not too good at the time either. His ankles had reached the point where they could no longer support his weight. It was very difficult for him to walk due to his size and lack of physical condition. He was a charming chap and always looked back fondly at the good old days in which he and his two partners had been able to stand on stage and perform their act. Rabane also landed the talents of June Travis. June lived from 1914 to 2008 and was the daughter of Henry Grabener, the vice president of the Chicago White Sox. He had been one of the key figures in the 1919 Black Sox scandal. She studied at UCLA and then the University of Chicago. She had been offered a contract with Paramount Pictures after a Paramount vice president noticed her in Miami, Florida at a White Sox exhibition game. But she suffered from stage fright and eventually returned to Chicago. 
she ended up being an actress, appearing in such films as Stranded from 1935, Ceiling Zero from 36, The Case of the Black Cat also from 36, and Love is in the Air from 1937. She said of her appearance in Monster Agogo, Oh please, woof, that's an embarrassment. I was in Chicago and I thought I had somewhat of a name. They knew they had this lousy picture, but they thought maybe my name might help it. It didn't. Me? A name? Fooled them, didn't I? But oh my god, that's an embarrassment. Well, I wouldn't take it seriously. What did I care? I didn't have a career then, I was out of it, and you know, it was fun to do. The details of the making of this film are a little sparse, but as far as I can tell, Bill Rabane began filming in 1961 and quickly ran out of money. According to the essay From Loftia to Wisconsin, The Song Remains Rabane by Stephen Thrower, Rabane's problem on Terror and Half Day began when he hired a full union crew only to find that paying industrial standard wages drained his budget after only a single week's shooting. By the way, Herschel Gordon Lewis worked on the crew. He returned to the film in 1963 after getting additional funding, but some of the actors, such as Peter M. Thompson, were no longer available. With the help of writer Doc Stanford, they rewrote the script and began filming new scenes with other actors. This was the first decision that added up to a confusing plot. Rabain managed to get about three-fourths of the film completed before he ran out of money again. It ended up sitting in the lab where it sat for a few years until Herschel Gordon Lewis came across it. Herschel Gordon Lewis lived from 1926 to 2016 and was known as the godfather of gore because he was best known for creating the splatter subgenre of horror films. He had just finished a film called Moonshine Mountain and was looking for a second movie to use as part of a double feature. He explained why this was necessary. At the time, the drive-in theaters were the best risk for our money. In order to control film rentals, you had to have both sides of a double feature. If you only had one picture, they would throw another picture in against yours and invariably tell both producers, oh, well the other picture was the key feature and gets the percentage. Your feature only gets a flat amount of money. A person that came in with both sides of a double feature didn't have to face that problem. I needed another movie because I only had one. Lewis thought it would be easy, cause as far as he knew, the film was almost done but he found out otherwise. Well, I thought, if there's 80,000 feet of film there, there has to be a movie in there somewhere. I was wrong. I simply bought it, the uncut negative. It turned out that he had cut off the slates, which made editing very difficult. But with the entire movie he had there, was no film there. We had to shoot a thousand feet of film of hands opening telegrams, feet walking, trying to flesh it out with a little narration over it. He made it as a deadly serious picture. I thought it was a parody. That's how we released it as Monster A Go Go. When asked if he had brought back Henry Height for any additional footage, Lewis said, No, I didn't. I only filmed footsteps, books, telegrams, stuff that didn't require talent. I had been a cameraman, as you may recall, for some of the picture when it was originally shot. The movie, as I remember, was shot spasmodically, from time to time, as financing became available. I recall shooting under Wacker Drive in Chicago, where traffic was just going by us. An example of what Lewis shot is in this scene. The close-up of the martini wasn't part of the original scene. I'm assuming the actor, who had just walked away, was supposed to talk on the phone, but that scene was never shot, so a close-up was added to cover the passage of time. Now, Herschel Gordon Lewis didn't put his name on the credits. Instead, he used the moniker Sheldon A. Seymour, a name he often used when he didn't want to use his own name. He is credited as producer as well as providing additional dialogue. I have read that he also narrates the film himself. 
Now the film begins with this rocking tune that is also used later for a dance scene. And that, my friends, is the highlight of the film. Right away, a narrator brings us up to speed. A space capsule is rocketed into orbit on schedule. Its mission, to observe new object circling the Earth. At least the film had the good decency to let us know right away how bad the audio was going to be. There's a big hole on one side. And, oh my God. <laughs> so the plot. Colonel Steve Connors, played by Phil Morton, gets sent to investigate a space capsule in which an astronaut has disappeared. This capsule looks barely big enough for a rhesus monkey. A man, Jim, a helicopter pilot, is killed off camera. Apparently, the astronaut has grown to a huge size and is roaming around the countryside killing people. Yet, I can't stop thinking about that tiny capsule and wonder how any man could have fit in there. And for about the first half hour of the 68-minute film, it has a pretty straightforward plot. I mean, it's horribly boring with horrendous sound, shot in Chicagoland during the ugliest time of the year, but the plot makes, well, some sense. And then, suddenly, we are introduced to a bunch of new characters. I'm assuming this is where Rebane returned to shooting after two years without the original cast. But you know, the only thing that I can think of that would be more boring than the plot of the so-called film would be for me to tell you the plot of the so-called film. I will say that there are long, pointless scenes, like the one in which some lady's car is out of gas and a man helps her get it started. It just doesn't seem to belong in this film. Freddie, would you mind going and sitting in the car? You're making me nervous. Sam? Thanks, Kelly. Lancelot? But I'm sure Bill Rabane had something in mind when he shot it. And then there are all the scenes on Lower Wacker Drive. They go on and on and on. The thing is, there's no character development, and the plot never really advances at all. And the end of the film, don't get me started about the end of the film. Now, when making a film, it is often common for having some person on the crew make the sound for an object, and that sound would be later replaced during post-production. Here's a scene where a crew person obviously made the sound of a ringing telephone. Colonel Connors. Now, Herschel Gordon Lewis, when you put this abomination together, how difficult would it have been to add the sound of a ringing phone? I ask you, how hard? Anyway, Joe Dante on Trailers from Hell said most porno films are better than this. And then he added, the twist ending is even worse than the rest of the picture, but I defy you to get that far. I will argue that the end of this film is neither a twist nor an ending. Herschel Gordon Lewis said, years and years later, after I had long forgotten about this picadillo, I got a call from Bill Rabane. He told me that Turner Classic Movies wanted to show Monster a Go-Go. And I said, don't you have some pictures of your kids? They'd do much better showing those. Now, Bill Rabane would go on to create the giant spider invasion in 1975, the Alpha Incident in 78, and the capture of Bigfoot in 79. All films which might end up one day on this YouTube channel. So I think this might be one of the only films I've ever watched that I just can't find anything good to say. About the best thing I can think of is, well, this film is only 68 minutes long. 